The slides for my talk are available on my uh, website, fherald.com, so go there. You can, you can get the slides, and inside the slides, you'll see the links to the demonstration reports that I'll be showing you parts of in this talk. Also, if you want to follow somebody on Twitter who likes to criticize poorly done statistics or poorly done machine learning, uh, follow uh, F2 Harrell on Twitter. Be glad to have you there discuss those issues and more. So just a brief mention of interactive graphics and what sort of levels of interactivity. Most of you know this really well, but there's full interactivity using uh, tools such as R Shiny where you can change your mind about what variables you're analyzing and uh, how you're analyzing them, such as how much smoothing to do in a non-parametric smoother. But what I'm going to be talking about uh, today is partial interactivity. So what sort of things can you do with partial interactivity? Uh, you can zoom and pan, uh, rescale axes, uh, provide extra information using pop-ups, such as hover text when you hover the mouse over an area. Uh, and then very importantly is you can select which traces of data that you want to show, which elements of a graph do you want to show. And then instead of having legends and explanations, uh, I think it's better to have information available on demand. So instead of devoting space to things to explain uh, what are the elements of a box plot, when you hover over that part of a box plot, just have the definition of which quantile you're showing pop up for you. So I'm using the Plotly package, which I'm a huge fan of, which is using the uh, famous D3 JavaScript um, um, graphics library. Uh, this, in my mind, is the best uh, uh, partially interactive scientific graphics system, uh, and it has its own language for the graphs. It's something you have to learn. It's much different from ggplot2's language, uh, but it gives you a lot of flexibility uh, you can also just convert any ggplot2 graphic to Plotly automatically uh, if you like the way ggplot2 laid out things. But if you want to add things sort of trace by trace, you might want to do what I did was go most straightly to uh, Plotly. So there's some new uh, Plotly graphics functions I've been adding to my existing packages over the last couple of years. Um, and I've been adding a lot of HTML methods as I get more away from LaTeX and PDF into HTML. Uh, I've added a whole lot of functions for creating customized HTML out output that you can include right in your reports. Um, and there's special HTML, method, HTML methods for the describe function and the summary M function. Summary M is like for creating table one uh, in a clinical trial report. Um, Hisbox P is for making spike histograms with extra information added to them. Surplot P is for making interactive survival plots. And then there's a, advanced HTML table makers using the uh, HTML table package in R. Uh, so let's get to uh, clinical trial reports. So the applications I'm talking about are uh, where you're doing, say, a randomized clinical trial to study a treatment versus some control. Uh, or you might be doing a drug study, uh, something in the pharmaceutical industry. And there's two types of clinical trial reports. There's sort of final clinical trial reports and there's interim reports as often used in monitoring the conduct of a clinical trial uh, that you might give to a data monitoring committee, also called a data and safety monitoring board. Uh, and so uh, the task that I started with was developing high level abstractions uh, for the job of creating reports. Most statisticians, when they create a big report, they sort of start over. They may have some code they use from previous trials, but they do a lot of new coding and it's quite repetitive. Uh, so if you can make high level abstractions, I think you can uh, foster uh, better statistical analysis and better reporting practices and make everything uh, reproducible um, and really minimize programming. Uh, reviewers of reports about uh, human uh, subjects research uh, get, get really tired of reading through tables and they usually fall asleep. They don't pay attention to things and tables are not that good for showing patterns anyway. Um, and so we really want to get rid of that. Now there's many standard components to clinical trial reports. These are some of them. Uh, a summary of how you were able to accrue subjects into the, into the study. 
uh, how did the patient flow occur and what sort of exclusions did you find uh, between the accrual of, or the screening of subjects before you randomized them to, a, to experimental treatment. Uh, describing baseline variables, longitudinal analysis, adverse event analysis, uh, lab safety parameters, uh, event timing and incidence, and sequential monitoring of uh, event probabilities. So the uh, philosophy um, is that tables uh, really do not lead to pattern recognition and graphics are better. If you have more than two numbers, I think a graph is better than a table. In other words, graph is almost always better. And graphs should use features that humans are really good at perceiving, such as position along a common scale. And then we need signposts on the graphics. So when I'm reading a long report, I lose track of where I am in terms of, say, which subjects are currently being displayed or analyzed. And I'll, I'll show you what that means. Tables are secondary. They can be in an appendix or hyperlinked. Or what's better, I think, is to have t pieces of tables as hover text uh, from a plot. Um, and then this was probably a little more controversial. Uh, most uh, studies where you're doing an A-B comparison, the way an A-B comparison is really uh, created is that confidence intervals for A are not relevant to the design and confidence intervals for B are not relevant to the design. They're actually inconsistent with a parallel group design. Uh, but the design is made to give confidence intervals for differences between A and B and that's what we want to emphasize. We want to show the entire distribution when possible, favor quantiles over means and standard deviations, and then I personally don't like percentages and I do everything I can to get rid of percentages. Uh, that's a personal opinion. Uh, so I have an older package that used the LaTeX and PDF model, and this is a very, very stable package. It's been around for many years, used in production in, in some really huge multinational clinical trials, and then the newer package, which is not on CRAN yet, which is H-Report for HTML report. So in these packages, there's lots of utility functions, high-level report components, unified handling of figure generation and captions. So when you write a long report, you spend a lot of time writing figure captions. So the figure captions are all automatically generated by these uh, packages. And then there's some new graphical elements. So the high-level functions are accrual report, uh, exclusion uh, report, descriptive statistics, event report, and serve report for time to event uh, analysis. Uh, now when you're writing a package and you want to implement things at a high level, you really have to survey best practices and it's your opportunity to implement best practices and also to create best practices if people like the package. And so uh, instead of doing one-off reports, if you start saying what should be in a patient screening report or accrual report, and really nailing that, and then making it so that uh, people can join the project on GitHub and they can extend the report with new options or change the format, uh, it's much better than just coding from scratch for each uh, report. Uh, number at risk report, uh, and then in the future there'll be a sequential monitoring boundary sort of report. And the, the format of all these functions, the way you call them, is using the formula language. You have your analysis variables on the left-hand side of the model separated by plus, and then you have your stratification variables and optional ID variable if you're analyzing something where there's multiple records per subject. So R Markdown creates HTML documents, and these allow semi-interactive graphics. So if you're using Plotly, uh, these, these, this uses HTML widgets, and those are included in your HTML without you doing anything special whatsoever, and they'll display beautifully on virtually any browser, and they'll automatically resize for viewing on a tablet, and it's very effective to view these reports on a tablet. And then our functions write HTML. They write regular tabular output, hyperlinks, navigation bars, and almost no tables and then hovering over a part of a graphic will display the relevant portion of the table. So I don't, I don't display whole tables anymore, but just portions of tables on demand. Uh, so now we get into the two examples, um, and then if you, if you download the slides, you can click on these links to see, see them in, in, in much more detail.
This first thing you notice is we have a new table of contents function in the HMIS package that it doesn't waste so much space on the left with your floating table of contents, and then it allows you to specify the level. Uh, so if you click on three, you'll get a three-level outline, and if you click on two, you'll just get a two-level outline. And one is a one-level, but the most important thing is to be able to get rid of the outline altogether. Um, and so the other thing that we have in, the, in this, you see that little uh, L, that's a little figure, uh, a, a icon for a graph, so that means this is a figure, and this is a short figure caption, and clicking there will go to that figure. Uh, this has a, a bunch of philosophy stuff, and then uh, notes about figure captions, and these are the signposts that are used uh, in each graph. And so uh, to keep me aware of where I am in a report, I have these signposts uh, below each graph. And so what that means is you have a, a little bar here where the red uh, is telling you uh, how many of the enrolled subjects are included in the current analysis being displayed. So if you saw a bar like that that's full height, that would mean you're analyzing all the enrolled subjects. Uh, this would mean you're analyzing uh, three quarters of the enrolled subjects, but all of the randomized subjects. Uh, this would show uh, that you're analyzing one-fourth of the enrolled subjects and only uh, one-half of the randomized subjects. So the green is the proportion of randomized subjects you're currently analyzing. And then if it's stratified for treatment, you'll get two more. And the last two bars will tell you what proportion of those randomized to one treatment is, are currently being considered in the analysis, what proportion randomized to another treatment B are being considered. Um, and then this is the first output, and you can click on code to see the code for any of these. Uh, this is the accrual report. So this, this actually took one of the longest uh, times to write, because when you have a multi-site clinical trial that may also be a multinational clinical trial, you have countries, regions, sites. So it's a very hierarchical organization. And to really summarize a multi-site, multinational trial the way that you need to, uh, it took, took a little bit of thought, but this is a trial snapshot. So you get your overall summaries about the, uh, the trial content and how many people are passing the screening stage. And then you get your accrual, and this is where Plotly comes in because you, you can just hover and see your target numbers of patients you should have accrued by that time uh, versus, uh, and I think I just expanded something. versus the actual number that you've accrued by that time. You see that's May 1994. Uh, there is the little uh, signpost over here, which you could barely see probably from where you are, and there's, a, there's some fine details showing you the number of non-missing observations analyzed and the groups being analyzed. You can just zoom in on that to see detailed denominators. Uh, this is just a dot chart showing the number of sites uh, how many subjects were randomized at how many sites. So looking at the, the um, randomization frequency over sites. Uh, and then we have um, uh, another graph like that. Then we start getting to baseline variables. And this is where we start using the features of Plotly uh, more effectively. So this is just showing the proportion um, of females in treatment A and in treatment B. And you see on the right, the legend shows you uh, the color code for treatment A and B, which is used throughout the report. Uh, and then if you hover over that, you'll see that this is 0.222 uh, of the subjects were female uh, in treatment A, and this was for all regions. And you can see the numerator 18 and the denominator is 81. So one thing I learned early on in this is you always give numerators denominators because somebody's going to ask you. You don't want to leave it to uh, guesswork. The other element of this graph, and of course you can, you can turn things off by clicking here. So if I didn't want to show the stratified data by region, I can just click on the right and that will turn those traces off. It's just a nice feature of Plotly, which you'll see more in a minute. But the other design consideration here is when you're showing the proportion randomized to A and proportion randomized to B who smoke, which is these two dots down here, you also see it stratified by region. So, and you can see that this is north, the north region here. 
Um, so I think of the stratification by region as something that's subservient to the main stratification. So the main stratification is treatment A versus B, and if I want to further stratify by region, those dots are below the main dots, and they're smaller. So uh, to denote that those are subservient or minor stratification, I'm using a smaller size, and if you click on the legend, you can turn those off. Now this is the way I've settled as my favorite way to display continuous data, is really you need to show the data. And uh, box plots don't really have a good ink to information ratio. They just don't show enough. A box plot will not show by modality. It'll completely hide it. But a histogram will show by modality. If you have digit preference in your data, uh, more, more uh, numbers ending in five or zero, you'll see digit preference very clearly. And so I found the secret formula for how many bins there should be in a histogram. It's either 100 or 200, independent of the sample size. But if, you're, if you have fewer than 100 distinct values in your data, you would use that fewer number as the number of bins. But you essentially have one bin per possible value up to about 200 bins. Uh, and that way you have all the resolution you need and it scales to huge data sets. Uh, but in addition to showing the histogram, which has a lot of information, you can show the elements of the box plot plus more. So you can see that below each histogram, you see the uh, mean is with a dot, the median is with a big uh, vertical bar, and then you see the quartiles in the 0.05 and 0.95 quantiles. So you see all the box plot information plus more, but the histograms are more informative. And then if you wanted to turn off the box plot stuff, you just click here. and that's, that's no longer there. So you can easily turn that off. So that's how I display uh, continuous data. That's stratified by treatment. You see this for a bunch of variables. And you'll see on all these displays, uh, like here in the fine print, you'll see denominators for each uh, variable being displayed. There's a number of non-missing values. Then there's various displays for longitudinal data. This is for longitudinal binary data, like adverse events. I display that lots of different ways. And then for just showing overall incidence of adverse events, I just use a dot chart where at each dot you're showing the proportion that have that event. And if you hover over it, you'll see this is uh, diarrhea treatment B, 20 out of 169 uh, subjects had that event. Uh, but then you have a confidence band for the difference. And if you, if you position that at the midpoint of the two, and it's the half of the width of the confidence interval, that has the property that it touches those two dots if and only if there's no significant difference at that alpha level that you're using for the confidence interval. And then uh, if you hover over the bars, you will see, um, now I can't get that, that to pop up right now. You're supposed to see the actual confidence intervals for the difference. And you can turn those confidence intervals off if you want by clicking in the right. Lots of ways to display longitudinal data. And then I want to show you just, um, just one item from the other report. This is the um, exclusion report. And so it analyzes what is causing patients to be excluded. And it, it doesn't ask you what order to analyze those in. It finds the major exclusion, which would be here, no significant coronary artery disease. That excluded 11 subjects from the trial. Uh, and then what excluded the next largest number of subjects was pneumonia within six weeks. And then for each exclusion, it reports the incremental exclusion. So how many new subjects are excluded because of pneumonia uh, after you've already excluded those without CAD? And it shows the marginal exclusions of how many people will be excluded because of pneumonia, whether or not they were excluded for anything else. Um, and then um, in terms of survival report, uh, this is the kind of output you get. And what I really like about it, besides having a confidence interval for the difference of two Kaplan-Meier curves, or this is one minus this, so this is cumulative incidence curves, is it recognizes that the number at risk is really a continuous variable. So I don't want to just show the number at risk at yearly intervals. I want to show that as a continuous function of the follow-up time. So as you hover over these different areas, you will, uh, you'll see that uh, you'll see the number of at risk at exactly that time point. 
It's just another way where I think you can use Plotly very effectively. So uh, if you get the, the uh, slides and go into those clicks, you'll see those and more information can be attained at these, uh, these three sites. So thank you very much for listening. So uh, one of the more popular questions, is there a function to make consort diagrams, or can you do alluvial plots for patient flows? That was asked, might have been the person asking it now, asked that on Twitter the other day, and somebody responded to use one of the general figure drawing uh, packages in R, like uh, I think, I don't know, it's TIXZ or one that uses GraphViz, but I don't think anybody's packaged those sort of things into a ready-to-use function. I think it would be nice. Maybe we'll do one more question. Um, how can a staff statistician working in clinical trials, do you think, convince PIs that it's worth it to switch over to HTML reports from Word or PDF? Uh, it, it'll depend on the age of the person on the committee. So I found that every committee has one person that's as old as I am, and, th and they want to see paper, not just PDF. They actually want to print the darn thing. And that's, that's kind of a lost cause. So I would stick to the younger committee members, giving them state of the art, and then let, letting them embarrass the older committee member. Thank you so much. I'm a big fan of HTML output, so I appreciate that answer, Frank. Uh, thank you guys all for attending. That's the end of this session. Uh, give a round of applause to all of our speakers.